how's everyone's weekend been so far? Good? Yeah, good. Uh, to be honest, my weekend has been a little bit slower than usual, um, which is probably good after youth camp last week, uh, which was incredible, by the way. So I just wanted to start off by saying, yeah, a huge thank you to everyone that was a part of, you know, the fundraiser or any other ways or came along. Yeah, it was just an awesome, incredible time. So yeah, lots of stories. So if you're wanting to hear more about it, come find me afterwards. Love to chat with you about it. Um, yeah, it was honestly incredible. Uh, here's a photo, actually, of, I don't know if that was up before, um, of Alex and I after our annual colour war. Uh, yeah, it was great. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so my husband, Alex, if you haven't met him, he's come to morning service a bit, but he's, yeah, very involved at night service. Uh, he would love to come along this morning to support me, but he's actually away on a boys' trip um, to see the Formula One, um, which I know... There's many people here that are uh, there as well. We've got Phil and Josh that are there as the, at the moment. So Phil won't be around today. Um, so they're all at the Formula One, which is fine. And that's okay. I don't need to be there. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he would love to be here, but he can't. Um, but to be honest, um, going into the Formula One this weekend, um, it, it was honestly sad because I felt like other people wanted to be there. And Alex didn't know anything about the Formula One. So he would share that he's going to the Formula One with people that wanted to be there. Um, this was about a month ago. Um, we had no idea anything about the Formula One. Honestly, he was a fake fan. Who, who's, a, who's a fan of Formula One? Anyone? Yeah, some people. Yeah. Oh, who has no idea? Like I did. No idea. Awesome. Um, if you had no idea like I did, um, this is a weekend um, where Formula One comes to Melbourne. Um, so it's... Australia's weekend, I guess, out of many races um, that they do for the World Championship. That's it in a little bundle. I didn't realise what a big deal it was. I thought it was just like big boy go-karting, I guess, um, which it kind of is. Um, but I just had no idea that it was quite big. Anyway, um, but I had no idea the history behind it, the story behind it. Anyway, so working up to the Formula One this weekend, we were advised to watch um, Drive to Survive. I don't know if anyone's seen this on Netflix. Um, anyway, it's great, very popular, would recommend. It shows the ups and downs of Formula One racing. Uh, first, of course, it tells you the basics. So there's 10 teams, two people on each team, and they race each other. Yeah, um, that's it. Um, and <laughs> what, but what, more than that, this is where it gets good. This is where it gets good. Um, more than that, you learn past the basics and you, you realise there's a lot of history to it. There's a lot of history to the teams, the rivalry between the teams, and not just the teams, like the teammates. So there's, yeah, again, two people each team and there's rivalry between that. It's really good. Um, and for the race for this championship. And each of these drivers, they're sharing their stories in this, in this show about their families and the battle it took to that, get to that point, the mental strain that it takes to undergo um, such a high-pressure work environment. And after a while, I found myself realising that I wasn't just watching the show, I was invested. I was really invested in this show, watching it with Alex in the month leading up to this weekend. And we found ourselves like knowing people and going, if, if, if they lost, I just know how they'd be feeling as they lost because I know them so well and I know their families would be disappointed in the crowd. And honestly, and now I found myself in my prep, um, last bit of prep yesterday, I was watching the Formula One um, at home and just being jealous, honestly, that I couldn't be there. But hearing the stories allowed us to see the whole picture. It gave us so much depth to the big story um, that it's more than just big boy go-karting um, that I used to think it was. And understanding the whole journey really made all the difference. And I know in my own life, this can be true in many different ways. Hearing the story of a new friend or a stranger and finding yourself understanding them so much more than you did before. Whether they share stuff about their childhood or stories of their family, you just get a greater picture of the, why they do the things they do, the way that they think, 
and it makes relationships so much deeper and it helps you to really, yeah, understand who they are. Hearing the story really matters. Hearing the ups and downs that have led someone to a, a moment allows us to understand all of who they are and what drives them. It allows us to relate to them in a much greater way. And this understanding penetrates our hearts, helps us to grow an understanding of ourselves in the process. And this is what I want for us to experience today. I don't want us to simply peer into a moment of Peter's life. I want us to really understand the bigger picture. This small moment that we, that, um, we got to hear this morning is this small moment filled with sadness and regret. And I want us to see the bigger picture and be moved to examine our own hearts in the process. So let me pray this morning. Dear Lord, we just yeah, praise you, God. We praise you for creating a space like this where we can continue to go back to passages that we've heard before and again and again or maybe for the first time and be refreshed, be challenged. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you give us the message that we need to hear today, that you'll use me, uh, that it'll just be all of your words, Lord. It'll be everything that you want us to hear. Um, Lord, we just thank you for the fact that the gospel is filled with incredible stories, with incredible figures um, that is so much deeper than we may have realized that we can go back to these stories again and again and see it from different perspectives. So we can go and see that people like Peter, people like Peter who, who were ordinary people in ordinary lives and got to witness the magnificence of your son coming in the flesh. Thank you, Lord, that we get to yeah, dig deep, and I just pray that we're able to yeah, really be challenged by your word today. Amen. So yeah, as I said before, I feel honoured to be up here again, especially on a special day like today, being Palm Sunday, the day where Jesus declares to all that he is Messiah, the Messiah we have been waiting for the fulfillment of the prophecy, the saviour we've been waiting for since the beginning of time. It's a day where Jesus was celebrated as the son of God and in less than a week later, he was crucified for it. And over the last few weeks, we've been wading through the gospel of Luke and we thought as a team, why not just keep going? Let's get, keep going to the end of Luke. So now we find ourselves at the end of Jesus' ministry according to Luke. So today marks the beginning of a very important week for us leading up to Easter, a time of profound reflection of life, death and resurrection of our Saviour. On this day, we commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where crowds welcomed him as their long-awaited Messiah. Yet amidst all the joy, we find a sobering account of one disciple's journey, Peter. Peter has been a biblical figure that has come up a lot for me recently. Uh, I'm a part of a young adults women's Bible study and we've been going through 1 and 2 Peter, which is his letters, letters filled with so much rich wisdom that has brought us to so many incredible conversations about God. On top of that, our youth camp on the weekend focused on the person of Peter. Maybe God is trying to tell me something. Uh, yeah, it's shared by our incredible Jack and Claire from um, the night service, if you've met them. They're beautiful and they volunteered to yeah, share with us and preach with us over the weekend. And they unpacked the power of Peter stepping out of the boat to walk toward Jesus, who was walking on the water. And understanding and hearing more stories about Peter. I've come to understand Peter as someone who all of us can relate to. A man who lives boldly, a man who li lives with little filter. I really appreciate Peter throughout the Gospels because he asks the questions I think we're all thinking. He acts instantly without filter to all the crazy stuff that he would be witnessing throughout Jesus' ministry. And I found him asking everything that was on my heart and stepping in when I felt like I would have too. He made me feel seen. And as a reader, you'll find yourself going, yes, Peter, that's awesome. You're such an inspiration. One moment. 
And then the other moment you're like, Peter, why? Why would you say that? That's just... Anyway, you just find yourself cringing like I did. Um, the most significant of these kind of low, cringeworthy moments um, is what we got to read today. So in these final moments of Jesus' life, Peter, the loyal and bold disciple, the rock of the church, is nowhere to be seen. In the final moments of it all, Peter was crushed by the fear of the world, denying Jesus three times. See, the exact thing Peter vowed to never do. And he prided himself on that. The Gospels truly share the ups and downs of his story. And for many of us reading these ups and downs, we see the ups and the, the amazing moments and we probably feel like we, we are similar to that. I find myself relating to those moments more. When I hear of Jesus, uh, Peter stepping out of the boat towards Jesus, I like to think that I, I would do that. I would do that for Jesus. But with the messier moments of Peter, I find myself questioning what on earth he was thinking and go, I would never ever do something like that. But I think if we all reflect on our own journey, his roller coaster of a life feels very similar to our own. And the gift, it is the gift that the gospel gives, gifts, sorry, it's the gift that the gospel gives us to be able to transport us into the story. And by taking a moment to step back and understand the full story of Peter, we can appreciate the whole story to a much fuller extent. And we can learn and gain more from his experience, allowing us the opportunity to reflect on our own hearts and lives, something we should all be striving for going into this week. So while Jesus should remain our focus as we read through the Gospels, we recognise Jesus as more as the ultimate goal rather than a relatable figure. It is really people like Peter, a person who in his brokenness strives to surrender himself to God messing up countless times and in huge ways. This is a person for us as believers today, we should look at and understand his journey with Jesus, understanding, so helping us to understand our own along the way. My hope is that by the end of this morning, for those that are not too familiar with Peter, you'll fall in love with this journey just like I have. And for those that are familiar, you'll be reminded of the very real and relatable journey Peter went on with God and how God breathes beauty and strength out of our weakness. So, for a little bit of backstory, Peter has gone by three names throughout the Bible, through the Gospels, a Simon, Cephas and Peter, first name Simon, and later renamed as Cephas, which translated to Peter, which means rock very cool name. Uh, yeah, P Jesus names him P um, Peter, meaning the rock, declaring that he will be the rock in which Jesus will build his church. A huge responsibility. I'd imagine Peter would be feeling overwhelmed. He'd feel an enormous pressure to reflect and trust in God in this process. He'd probably be feeling a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, I could only imagine the battle he would have with pride as he gains that responsibility from Jesus. As mentioned before, he walks on water briefly before he starts sinking and talks as much as all the other disciples put together. Um, he serves as the primary source of Mark's gospel and he writes remarkable epistles, uh, one and two Peter. He is told by Jesus that he will be persecuted and ultimately put to death for his beliefs. And he finishes his life crucified upside down in Rome under the Emperor Nero at around 64 AD. Peter's journey with Jesus began by the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He was a fisherman mending his nets when Jesus called him, come, follow me, and I will send you to be fit to fish for people. In that moment, Peter left everything behind, his livelihood, his family, his comfort, to follow Jesus. You could only imagine the battle he would have had in his mind, this overwhelming feeling of love being seen, being, being held by Jesus, yet only to, be, to give up everything in his life. That would have been an incredible decision that he made. 
As one of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter witnessed countless miracles, heard profound teachings and experienced the intimate fellowship of their shared ministry. He walked on water, the first of disciples, the first of the disciples to confess Jesus as the Messiah, and was present at pivotal moments in Jesus' ministry, including the Transfiguration and the Last Supper. He asked the questions many of us would think of but never say directly. Uh, There was a moment when Jesus was teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God and Peter asks, we have left everything to follow you. What then do we get? Uh, This is one of those questions and comments by Peter that leaves us just cringing and going, do you not understand uh, what this is all about? But it also helps us to reflect on our own hearts. It's a question that many of us ask regularly. Reading through the Gospels from his perspective, you can only imagine the high and the joy he would feel in some moments, only to be left with low and disappointment of failing in the next. There's probably nights that he would have questioned himself and sat in guilt for not living up to the responsibility and call Jesus put on his life. The amount of time he would have doubted Jesus and his choice to use someone like him. It really feels like his story is constantly taking a step forward and a step back. And this leads us up to where we will be landing today. His reaction to Jesus' arrest. But first, I think we need to travel back just a little bit further um, in the chapter. Back to the Passover. So we'll be reading from Luke 14, if you've got your Bibles. It says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the, of the covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is the, with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them is considered the greatest. Another one of those cringy moments where Jesus reminds them in summary that the first will be last and the last will be first. And we're going to skip a little bit to 33. In response to Peter having, hearing about the suffering Jesus is about to face, he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. You will deny three times that you know me. Now, knowing Peter, we could probably understand he would struggle to believe this. He's walked on water due to his faith. He is the rock on of the like which Jesus will build his church. He has witnessed countless miracles and has sacrificed so much already for Jesus. Yes, he's made so many lapses in judgment, but seeing his messiness has only caused him to want Jesus more. Plus, now Jesus has warned him about what is about to occur. He probably feels like he's confident that he can conquer it. He's confident that he can remain steadfast. Following some time after this, at the Mount of Olives, after the Passover, Jesus is arrested. Peter, being our guy who acts, cuts off the ear of a man in the group. While I can imagine Peter would have been filled with adrenaline, believing he has done right by Jesus, Jesus instead rebukes him, healing the man on the spot. So let's keep reading. 
Then seizing him, sorry, we're at 54. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, he sat down together. Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. He looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know who you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter, just like he did when he was walking on the water. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And so on the night of Jesus' arrest, As fear gripped Peter's heart and the weight of the impending crisis bore down upon him, he succumbed to the pressure and denied knowing Jesus, not once, but three times. Jesus' denial is a stark reminder of the frailty of human nature and the power of fear to overshadow our faith and convictions. Despite his bold declarations of loyalty, Peter faltered in the face of adversity choosing self-preservation over solidarity with his beloved saviour. And after reading his whole story, I really felt it when he wept bitterly. I can imagine the extreme pain, disappointment and shame he would have felt, not having held the weight that he believed Jesus placed on his shoulders, the rock of the church, to not only, to not just not uphold the responsibility, but to deny his saviour completely, while only hours before promising to be loyal until the end. I'd imagine he'd be questioning his capability to come back from this one. Other disappointments have been hard, but this one? How could he ever come back from this? From the time we were kids, we were told, three strikes and you're out. And Peter has had more strikes than he could count. Thankfully, God's kingdom operates on an entirely different basis. And we can never let God down one too many times. If we love him and own up to our sins, confessing them and asking him for forgiveness, God keeps forgiving us and putting us back in the game. If anyone has ever understood the marvel of God's goodness to keep us giving second and third chances, it was Peter. Peter failed in every aspect. He failed. But God didn't. This week we get to reflect on what God has done for us, sacrificing himself for us and taking our place. After his resurrection... Jesus made a point of repeatedly reassuring Peter that he still had great things in store for him, for this very human and less than perfect disciple. The story does not end with Peter's denial. Despite his failure, Jesus never abandoned Peter. Jesus reaffirmed Peter's love and commission to feed his sheep. As you read through Acts you see incredible stories of Peter sharing the good news to hundreds, so many, so many, so many people. And with his letters, how they've impacted generations and generations of the church and realigned churches to what the true message God brings us. You can see the generations that have been impacted by God's work through Peter, a very messy and less than perfect disciple. And this journey Peter went on from discipleship to denial to redemption is a powerful testament to this transformative power of Jesus' love and forgiveness. It reminds us that no matter how far we may stray or how grievous our sins, there is always hope for reconciliation and renewal in Christ. Later in life, 
Peter looks back on this experience and reminds his fellow Christians that Jesus personally carried our sins in, the body, in his body on the cross so that we can be dead in sin, dead to sin, and live for what is right. By his wounds you have been healed. And once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. As Peter discovered, it's never too late for us to return to Jesus, confess our sins, and ask for his forgiveness. My hope for all of you today is that you feel seen. I know we've barely even scratched the surface with Peter and his walk with God. But I hope this messy walk helps you to reflect on your own. Never feel good enough about your relationship with God. Peter didn't either. Try to serve God from your own strength, strength, but only to be left overwhelmed and disorientated. Peter has too. Failed over and over, feeling like you've learned from your mistakes, yet continue to stumble and turn away from God. Peter has too. Weeping from the brokenness of our lives, Peter has too. Let go of the shame God has already saved us from. Let go of the fear you have for the world God has already conquered and reigns over. You are seen, you are loved. God calls you to so much more. He calls you to surrender your whole heart knowing all that is before you can be only done in his strength alone. God fulfills his promise and builds his church using Peter. Peter's journey has equipped him with a wisdom that brings so many to God. God demonstrates his strength through Peter's weakness, brings beauty out of the mess. Will you let him do the same? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Peter, whose journey from discipleship to denial to redemption reminds us of the boundless love and mercy. As we reflect on Peter's life, let us examine our own hearts and acknowledge the times when we have denied or betrayed Jesus through our words, actions, or indifference. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to trust in your forgiveness, to let go of the shame that holds us back, holds us back from you. Free us, Lord. We know that a relationship with you is freedom from all of that. So I just pray that we're able to trust in that. Help us to follow you wholeheartedly, even in the face of opposition or adversity. As we journey through this week, I pray that you'll help us to deepen our faith in knowing that you died for us, you've taken all of that. Grant us the courage to remain steadfast in our commitment to follow you, no matter the cost. May we remember that even in our moments of weakness, you never give up on us, but continue to extend your grace and forgiveness. Help us to be like Peter and embrace the opportunity for renewal and transform transformation in you. Amen.